What's up, guys? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any more of our videos. Also, make sure you follow us all over social media so you don't miss any of our content or show announcements. All right, let's move on to our mailbag. I had a bunch of questions around this kind of theme, but I just picked one for you guys. Uh, what is it with the all-knowing talking heads who keep insisting that teams have to trade away a bunch of highly promising players in order to become competitive? We heard the same thing from endless sports commentators about the 2022 Warriors. Let's not forget that the Warriors came within a hair's breadth of trading Clay for Kevin Love and that they tried and failed to trade Steph for Andrew Bogut. And now, here you are, almost raving about how much better the Warriors are this season than you expected, but still insisting that they get rid of several players in exchange for some magic bullet, even though the season is only four games old and no one knows just how good this incredibly deep team will be or what the ceiling for some of their younger players who just keep getting better every year drives me crazy. But I had dozens of Warriors fans uh, complaining about the idea that I say that they need to trade. A couple of things. First of all, uh, you're right, it's only been four games. So I'm not saying they should trade, make a trade right now. I think it's a deadline deal. Like the, you wait till the deadline. Like I, for the exact, because like, here's the thing. If you get 50 games under your belt and Buddy Heald is like still averaging 20 something points per game and shooting in the high 40s from three, like then maybe it is that Steve Kerr unlocked Buddy Heald and there's your secondary shot creator. Like, let's see. It's only been four games and he's shooting over 50% from three. I have a hard time believing that's going to stay that hot throughout the remainder, remainder of the season. No one shoots high volume mid 50s from three, not in the history of the league, right? So, like, there's that element to it. Two, you don't know what stars are available yet. Like, you got to wait to see what it is. But there's a very specific reason why I've been advocating for this. First of all, this is not the 2022 Warriors. The 2022 Warriors had Jordan Poole, a better version of Andrew Wiggins, and Clay Thompson. All three of those guys are better offensive players than anybody on the Warriors roster right now not named Steph Curry. Now, again, we'll see if Buddy Heald just suddenly trans transforms into an all-star level guard, then we need to have a different conversation. But now you're leveraging four games of evidence versus, well, I mean, Buddy's been in the league a decade or close or something like that. So like, let's wait to see more before we jump on that boat. But like, there's a very specific reason why I've been talking about this. I broke it down for you guys the other day, but the Warriors, their second and tertiary uh, uh, secondary and tertiary shot creators are not nearly at the same level as the west of the uh, the rest of the Western Conference. You got there's been a very specific thing that has taken place over the course of this year. They've beaten the shit out of bad teams. And by the way, the Pelicans they made a trade where they sent out two high level role players in Larry Nance uh, and Dyson Daniels to Atlanta, and they got back Dejounte Murray, an All Star level guard who hasn't played yet this year because he's hurt. So like. The, like they're a team that is in a crisis of talent at this point. They're nowhere near as good defensively as they were last year. They were supposed to get this offensive boost. They haven't gotten it yet. Like it's a good win. They're quality wins. If you win down players the way you have against the Pelicans, uh, Warriors fans should be through the roof ecstatic. I'm not trying to undercut that, but what I'm saying is you're not playing that limited version of the Pelicans when you get to the postseason. There are better teams out there. You guys have played one really good defense so far this year, the Clippers, and your offense stalled out and you lost. Like Even when Steph got hurt, you were down double figures. So like that's kind of the main thing that I'm getting at here. The Warriors have demonstrated through the four or five games or whatever they've played, they, they, they have let, they've demonstrated that they have an extremely high floor. And that will beat the injured Pelicans and the Blazers and the Jazz, and that's going to beat the shit out of all the bad teams in the league. I, I've, I've said that from the beginning. I am very, very confident in this Warriors team ability to maintain a good record through just a very strong institutional basketball character and lots and lots of speed like we've talked about so much. Like I think they're going to win plenty of games. That's not the issue, but you will play better teams. The Western Conference is stacked with really good teams, really good defenses. The Eastern Conference has really good defense. You guys, are, you guys are going to play the Celtics here in a, uh, I want to say like less than a week. So like, there's a lot of, there's a lot more to this journey than we've seen to this point. And all I'm saying is, you're uniquely equipped. You had no Wiggins, no DeAnthony Melton, no Steph, and you beat the Pelicans. I didn't watch last night's game, but I watched the the, the first one of the two. And uh, I, th I think all three guys were out again for that one. But, like, the point is, is, like, you're 
you're deep. You can afford to lose a couple of guys. Oh, so, Jason, I don't want to trade Kaminga or Moody. Fine, don't trade Kaminga or Moody. Trade different guys and include draft compensation. Whatever it is you want to do, that's fine. But you have like 13 rotation players and you have this incredibly high floor. You have some assets, draft assets that you can send out in a deal. And right now, you need a more reliable secondary shot creator if you're going to hang with the better teams in the West. Like, I am super optimistic about this Warriors team in the big picture because of how high their floor is. But I don't think they have enough offensive talent to truly hang with the top teams in the league. So then again, you got to ask yourself what you want. If what you want as a team is to be the feisty young team that plays super hard and wins against all the bad teams, cool. But then there's not a very high ceiling there. And like, I know, like, guys, you're, this is not the 2022 Warriors. That's not what this team is. That, the 2022 Warriors had more firepower than this team. Steph was a better version of himself. Clay was still playing at a, uh, a pretty high level at, at that point in time. Uh, Andrew Wiggins was the best. It was the best season Andrew Wiggins ever had in his entire career. Like there's Jordan Poole got a $30 million annual deal out of what he did in that season. So like, let's just be real for a second. Like this team is very deep, tons of hardworking role players. They're young, they're fast, they're feisty. There's a lot of good, but they've been beating up on some bad teams. I think if they want to contend, if that that's what you got to ask yourself, do you want to contend? Because if you want to contend... Steph needs a number two that he can count on night in and night out to give him 20 plus points without fail, efficiently, and in a way that actually fits well with their core lineup. So the Jonathan Kaminga stuff, like he had a stretch last year where he scored 20 plus like a bunch of times in a row, but it's like, do they trust him on defense? Do they trust him when Steph is on the floor, when, when they're really running their offense, do they trust him not to make stupid decisions? Right? Like, that's kind of the thing that I'm talking about. I don't know what that player is. I'm not saying you make that deal now. It's a deal for February. But if this team, this, the exciting thing is you have 13 rotation players. You can afford to package three rotation players and draft compensation to somebody else for a high level player that will then bring you back a deep team that has Steph and a legit number two and a much better chance to contend this year. That's the type of question you got to ask yourself. Again, let's see what happens. Uh, like, we'll see. If, if guys, I'll be right there with you. If you start beating the shit out of the good teams too, if you start like if you beat Boston and you beat Denver and you beat uh, Oklahoma City and you beat, and it's just like, oh my goodness, this is something special here. Yeah, I'm not going to be advocating for a trade anymore. But I'm saying I don't think that's going to happen. This is a really exciting story, but there are a lot of teams that have a lot more firepower in the NBA than the Golden State Warriors. And when they run into them, their offensive limitations, I expect, will show just like they did in the Clippers game earlier this year, which is the one really good defense that they've played to this point in the season. Hello, Jason. What do you think might, who do you think might be the next Derek White or PJ Washington that can help a contender reach a, reach the finals or win a title in 2025? This is an interesting question. And so again, we're looking at guys here that are like good defensive players that can guard multiple positions, but that are also useful within the context of a team offense. And the four names that I wrote down, and there's probably a bunch more of these. I I, I just wanted to come up with some off the top of my head, but Bilal, Koulib uh, <laughs> Bilal Koulibaly, with Washington at an amazing game last night, did an incredible job defensively on Trey Young. That's an uh, that's the type of uh, of of guy that like legitimately just does so much dirty work that he just raises the floor of your team substantially. Ryan Dunn, and we talked a lot about with the Phoenix Suns the other day. Kassan Wallace is another guy with Oklahoma City. His unique ability to really guard the ball, but also be this like kind of cog in an offense that can shoot, screen, cut, finish around the rim, all that stuff. And then Dyson Daniels is another guy who's been doing a really good job for the Atlanta Hawks. I think all, all four of those guys are guys that I'd keep an eye on as guys that'll play big roles on really good teams in the future. Uh, lots of Laker-related questions. The um, uh, This was a, a, a question about... The, I want to say this was the Cavs game. This game was a hard watch, not going to lie. D'Lo kept getting burned all game. Transition D was embarrassing. No one was boxing out or grabbing rebounds. I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt because it's a new system, but we'll see if they can get it together. So really ugly game for the Lakers last night. I too am trying to cut them some slack in the sense that 
It was your fourth game, your fourth game in six nights. You're traveling across the country. It was less than 48 hours of rest because they went from a 7 p.m. game time to a, a 4 p.m. game time in Pacific time, right? Um, so you're turning around really quickly with travel. Yeah, uh, LeBron is old. Uh, like That's a lot of basketball for an old guy to play in a short period of time. I, and they've been really sharp for the other four games. So like I'm trying to cut them some slack too, but I'm not going to lie. That was a pretty depressing performance in Cleveland. They looked... It looked like the team from last year in December, where there was like almost like a lifeless ca- uh, 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 quality and an un- uh, unwillingness to fight. But I'm I'm trying to just crumple that game and throw it away. And the main reason why is because there literally wasn't a single Laker who played well. Anthony Davis played th- like he's been playing like the best player in the world for the first four games. Played so bad yesterday. Jared Allen whooped his ass. There was this weird play in the first half where Jared Allen accidentally caught him in the face with the with his forearm. And AD just like from that point forward, just like mentally checked out of the game. Like it was crazy. And then LeBron James, like he put up box score numbers, but I thought he was really bad in this game. Austin Reeves was really bad in this game, was throwing the ball away all over the place. D'Angelo Russell, once again, just not hitting enough shots to justify the fact that he's getting relentlessly attacked on defense every single time down the floor. It's his third straight game where he just got absolutely barbecued. Rui had a, a rough game as well. Once again, still trying to dunk on everybody underneath the basket, which isn't working. There was a lot of stuff with their spacing that was off. The like everyone was like, "Oh, Dalton Connect, he had 18 points." I thought Dalton Connect was awful in the times when the game was actually within reach. He's played two really bad games in a row. Everyone played poorly. There wasn't a single Laker I could point to and be like, "You know, he played well today." And usually that is. Usually you drop a game on the road and it's like, "Well, hey, so and so had a good game. This other dude off the bench played really well." Like, no, every Laker played poorly. So, I'm trying to just crumple it up and throw it away. Here's the thing. Like, this is part of the this is part of basketball, right? Like the Lakers are not as good as the Boston Celtics, to be clear. But the Boston Celtics, similarly, went into Indiana yesterday and found themselves down 20-plus, right? Like, th- that's – the NBA is so good, and there's so much talent, and teams are so fast now, and they play with so much pace because all the coaches have figured out that you want to play with pace, that, like, you show up on the road in front of a raucous crowd, and they're playing hard, it's it's like a buzzsaw. It's really, really hard to win those games. And so, like, the thing is, though, is Boston can afford, because of their talent level – to have a certain amount of of you know lackadaisical performances that pop up from time to time, and even in that game, they they sent it to overtime. They they had a good chance to come back and win that one, right? But like for the Lakers, you're not as talented. You have to be super sharp. You have to establish really good habits throughout the season. So I'm okay with what happened last night, as long as that's few and far between. Like the personnel limitations on display, like the D'Lo just constantly getting attacked. That's a real problem. They're going to have to figure that out. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. But like, um, uh, as a matter of fact, I got another question here. Uh, what do you think about Rui Hachimura's contributions this season? All last season on the, Na- uh, the, the Lakers Nation preseason podcast, you seem really low on Rui. Now we needed to upgrade those two wing spots between Austin at the one and LeBron and AD at the four or five. Has Rui's performance throughout the start, the se- start of the season changed your mind? I, I think that they're fine at that position with the development of Rui over the course of this year, but that two spot desperately needs to be upgraded with a real athlete that can guard. Austin Reeves can't guard Donovan Mitchell. It's too much to ask. He needs to guard a Darius Garland level offensive player, right? You need a real athlete to put in that specific situation. You can't have a defender on the floor that every single time the offense puts them in an action, they get a bucket or a foul out of it. That's what they're getting with D'Lo right now. It's a huge problem. So there are some personnel weaknesses that the Lakers need to address, but sometimes you just have a shitty night in the NBA, and I thought that's what happened to the Lakers last night. The key is they need to be few and far between. I want to see them go into Toronto, take care of business. Go into Detroit, take care of business. Go get a win in Memphis. No one's going to give a shit that you had a bad night in Cleveland. It's about... The, that being the exception and not the uh, the normal thing that you're running into. Uh, all right, two, two last questions, both from the same guy, just actually uh, more on a personal level with me. When you play basketball, what's usually your role on defense? Are you a point of attack perimeter defender, a wing defender, or are you considered a big at 6'6", since there probably isn't that many big guys? So on my men's league team, we have a lot of, of guys who played uh, Division I uh, overseas professionally, things along those lines. And we have a big guy on our team named Aaron Anderson who played professionally overseas, and he's about my size. And he played big his entire career. So like, fortunately with that group, I get to leverage more as a perimeter defender I uh, I am at my best 
guarding on the perimeter because I have I have really long arms and I can move my feet pretty well. But like typically when I go play pickup, I almost always have to guard the big just because like you said, there's just not that many big guys in the city and I weigh 230 pounds. And so I'm just the best option to throw at, at people like that. But like on defense, like I, when I was at Arizona Christian, my last year, this is how I stayed in the rotation. I was a scorer in junior college and averaged double figures and had a bunch of 20 plus point games. And I had a career high uh, over 30, but like that was at a lower level of basketball. And then I went to play NAIA and I was playing with two All-American guards and I was not good enough to get action run for me. And all the action was being run for the guards for good reason. They were much better basketball players than me, right? Or at least it, like they were, they were certainly better offensive basketball players than me. And so I, the way I stayed in the rotation on that team was I just became the team's best wing defender. And so like I just watched a bunch of film on every single guard that, I would, uh, that we would be playing in any particular game and try to figure out their tendencies. And I just really channeled my abilities in the direction of perimeter defense. And I was actually able to maintain a role on that team within that context. That's always been like, I would actually argue when I was in college, that was the one thing I was really, really good at. Even when I scored, a lot of it was like bad team scoring. Like I could shoot, but I was very, very streaky. So I'd have games where I shot super well and scored a bunch of points. And then I have games where I couldn't make shit. Right. So like that was kind of a uh, fool's gold in a lot of ways. I was a limited ball handler and I didn't see the floor well when I was younger. So like, even though I had a bunch of big scoring games, I, I was a limited offensive player at that point in time, but I was big, I was athletic, I could guard. That was like the one thing I could really do at a high level when I was in college. Now that I've gotten older, I'm so much better on the offensive end of the floor and I, I, I've developed a lot in that way. But when I was in college, that was the way that I was deployed. Uh, last one, what's your vertical jump? <laughs> so I was uh, 205 pounds when I was playing in junior college and I was freaky athletic, like elbows above the rim, freaky athletic. But then I had a foot injury and when the foot injury happened, I spent the entire rehab doing upper body lifting and I put on like 20 pounds of muscle. And when I came back, I was still a very good athlete and it was worth it because I'm a much better basketball player because of my strength, but I kind of lost that like crazy over the rim ability. I'm still a good athlete. Still to this day, I can I can uh, uh, jump and dunk pretty well. But like every once in a while, I'll see a video of me when I was younger uh, before the foot injury playing, and I'm like, holy shit, because I was like, I was just skinny and I had you know super long arms, and I could like just fly in a way that I couldn't at I can't at this point in my life. But the big thing is, is I'm 33 now, and like uh, like I'm about to go play basketball later today, and like I we'll see how I feel. Like I went out there on Tuesday, I wasn't feeling great. Like that's the, it's always like a, on any given day, I might feel great. I might feel absolutely terrible, but that's just kind of the journey as you, as you start to put the miles on. 